Bicons and Cabazon. As I told you earlier, bicons means ancestrally biflagellate. You know, so it has got the, in the in the motile phase of its life history there are two flagella that is called the bicon. It's a major group of the eukaryotes. The other major group is unicorns, which we have already covered. So the, we will uh, see the introduction of the bicons and the very important group Carbozoa, that is the protista, in this uh, uh, short video. So the bicons have got three kingdoms yeah, according to the cavalier smith six kingdom classification you see so half of the whole kingdoms are in bicon so it's really really important uh, member of the uh, the taxonomical group you see so the first kingdom is protozoa also known as carbozoa carbozoa right so uh, second one is chrome alveolata which includes the kingdom chromista and other protists like alveolata and rhizaria and the third major kingdom is plantae or archiplastida as the name says archi means old plastida means plastid so this is a group in which the plastids are the oldest while the second one and third one that is chromal violeta and cabozoa the plastids are derived that means uh, that the plastids came through the secondary endosymbiosis but the archiplastida the plastid came through the primary endosymbiosis so there is a main difference between all these groups you see so the first group is kingdom protozoa that is uh, carbozoa has got two major uh, you know divisions in it, in it excavata and rhizaria so there are no consensus exists that rise the, the real position of rhizaria you know so according to the cavalier smith's uh, original classification rhizaria is part of carbozoa but nowadays uh, rhizaria has been removed from the kingdom protozoa that is carbozoa and placed under chrome alveolata under a supergroup SAR you know staminopiles alveolates and rhizaria so the consensus is still emerging so we'll have to wait and watch what exactly is going to happen for the rhizarians you know so in summary the carbozoa has got two main uh, divisions excavate and rhizaria while subsequently, we, as we will see, chromal violeta has got chromista, that is a kingdom chromista, that is, a, you know, the brown algae, staminopiles, and alveolates, plus rhizaria, as per the SAR, uh, you know, the supergroup is all about. And archiplastida is a kingdom plantae. Uh, it includes bilifyta and viridae plantae. So these are the main, uh, you know, classification of the bicons. So coming first, uh, the, the bicon, as uh, we have already discussed, a bicon is two flagella, by Cont. Cont means flagella in Latin. So it is a eukaryotic cell with two flagella. At least the motile phase, the ancestral trait is that it must be having two flagella, right? So I mean, so it's a generalization, but uh, as we have already covered in this class, that not all has got flagella. Not uh, not even they are motile. For example, the red algae, which is uh, which is part of the Archiplastida, the red algal motile phase is you know there is no motile phase in its life cycle you see the the gametes are uh, non-motile non-flagellate you see but still the ancestral character is that it must be having two flagella so bicons include archiplastida that is plants and relatives including the red algae and carbozoa carbozoa is excavator and rhizaria i told you rhizaria is sometimes uh, out of carbozoa and grouped under sar supergroup Plus, the third one is chrome alveolata, as the name saying, chrome alveolata, chromista and alveolates. So, chromista, uh, uh, you know, it's a kingdom it's by itself, which is the brown algal kingdom, chromista, and alveolates, alveoli, it is in, in our lungs, right, the sacs. So, yes, that is what the Latin says. Uh, the meaning of the word alveoli is uh, the sacs, small sacs, so organisms are called sacs, you know, uh, in, in its cell. So, kingdom chromista and alveolate. So, this is how the if you go to the interactive tree of life, this is how it looks like the classification. Don't worry, we will come one by one. So, the first is kingdom protozoa, also known as carbozoa. So, what uh, what are the this uh, the peculiarities of this kingdom? So, most are unicellular. Some are multicellular. Then these are exceptions. You see, some are autotrophic, while others are heterotrophic. So, it's like an admix of various. Uh, unicellular eukaryotes together in this uh, particular kingdom and mostly aquatic so especially if you are an aquatic ecologist or you know aquatic botanist or marine botanist or terrestrial limnetic botanist so in that case yeah so this kingdom protozoa is really important uh, you know to see the diversity so if you take a, a drop of water from a pond and look under the microscope 
chances are very high that this pond of water uh, you know the uh, the, whole, the droplets uh, from the pond must be containing uh, you know hundreds of prote protozoa in it so how to identify and what are the main uh, groups of the protozoa so excavate is classically one of the core group of the protozoa and then rhizaria as i told you rhizaria position is not really clear it's ambiguous so in inside excavate there are two major group discoba and uh, metamonada you know so discoba includes euglena trypanosoma etc and metamonada includes gaiardia trichomonas uh, you know trichomonas and so on right and then comes the rhizaria right rhizaria contains uh, you know the cercozoa foraminifera and radiolaria these are the major groups of the rhizaria so excavator and rhizaria as inside excavator is discoba and metamonada and inside rhizaria there is cercozoa foraminifera and radiolaria so what is cercozoa various amoebae and flagellates usually with phyllose pseudopods you know uh, common in the soil so pseudopods are phyllose uh, you know it's like uh, rope like or uh, you know the hair like uh, pseudopods that, that is a speciality of this cercozoa now foraminifera is very interesting forams are very common in ocean you know the marine water so foraminifera amoeboids with reticulase pseudopod reticulase means mesh like or a net like pseudopods common as marine benthos so benthos are bottom dwelling organism that you can see uh, when you do a trawler you know or when you scratch the bottom of the seabed then you can see that a lot of foraminifera in it right so this is a sediment core if you if you take out the sediments from the ocean bed by the way foraminifera are even identified in challenger deep you see 12,000 meters deep the deepest uh, trench of the world you see marina trench right uh, near japan so this particular place the challenger deep because the it's basically the submarine right challenger has uh, been to that place so to take out the samples was later analysis found that it has got foraminifera it's immense hydrostatic pressure and still forams can live in right so it is basically reticulate pseudopods and common in marine benthos and radiolarians are amoeboids with axopods so axopods are like you know the like star like uh, pseudopods right so axopods are pseudopods uh, which are star shaped so which is uh, which is common in uh, ocean of course just like from but these are plankton while frams are benthos benthos are bottom dwellers while planktons are uh, you know floating on the sea surface so that is the main difference radiolarians you can find in the sea surface water while frams you can see in the uh, seabed you know so as per latest phylogenomic study that has been published in uh, plus one you can see that rhizaria is more related to chrome alveolates that is the chromista and alveolates uh, that is uh, something called sar supergroup i just introduced that sar supergroup means traminopyle alveolate and rhizarians so its position within the carbozoa is highly controversial you see it is uh, not supported by the phylogenetic systematics so uh, coming to the supergroup excavates you know so these are single celled flagellated protists uh, there are four major phyla inside the excavate diplomonads parabasalids euglenozoa and kinetoplastids and uh, if you look at inside this phyla the you know phylogenetic relationship between the phyla you can see that diplomonads and parabasalids together form one clade you know this is this forms uh, you know the it's a, it's a clade you see it's a monophyletic group similarly euglenozoans and kinetoplastids also form one clade so it is a, a monophyletic group that means that euglenozoans and kinetoplastids have got one common ancestor not shared with the other two groups diplomonads and parapasalids so the major members of diplomonads include gaiardia uh, you know gaiardia lamblia and other uh, pathogenic organism as I have already explained to you this dot means that it has got pathogenic uh, you know organism animal pathogenic organisms so that is why this color the, the red the animal you see diplomonads have got an example is gaiardia parabasalid example is trichomonas trichomonas viridae for example euglenozoans example is euglena photosynthetic kinetoplastid example is trypanosoma and leishmania leishmania donovoni Trypanosoma gambians, you know, all these are 
very very important pathogenic organisms right so first is diplomonads right so these are adapted to anaerobic environment see it can live in anaerobic environment this is uh, remember this is actually a eukaryote right and non photosynthetic organism can live in anaerobic organisms you know so not many eukaryotes can live in anaerobes right so usually anaerobic environment is really harsh uh, usually it's uh, uh, archaea and other some eu bacteria can live in but these are some exceptional eukaryotes that can live in anaerobic environments it lacks plastids both chloroplast and mitochondria see even it doesn't have a mitochondria it's very very interesting creature is it lacks mitochondria but have mitochondrial genes in the nucleus so it has got legacy of the past mitochondria you know so its ancestor might be having mitochondria and then subsequently it lost it you see so diplomonads have got two nuclei like d you know the, the word starts with diplo right so it has got two nuclei and it has got multiple flagella right gaiardia lamblia uh, is an example that causes gaiardiasis you know uh, that is a human disease right gaiardia lamblia so uh, as i told you it has got two nuclei and it has got multiple flagella as uh, you can see in this one it's very interesting right <laughs> if you look at the shape of it, it just looks like a heart shape right uh, love shape <laughs> yes next is retortomonads so phylum retortomona includes commensal and parasitic uh, unicell so commensal means it can become parasitic when the conditions favor them right otherwise it is just uh, harmless so parasitic unicell so it lacks mitochondria and golgi bodies it doesn't have even golgi bodies or uh, you know the mitochondria in it so parabasalids is uh, yet another very important group uh, uh, of the excavates parabasalids move by means of flagella and an undulating part of the plasma membrane so both contribute in the locomotion flagella and plasma membrane so this clade may have diverged from the main eukaryotic clade very early so it's an early splitting clade this is one of the earliest non eukaryotes you know uh, parabasalids so one example would be trichomonas vaginalis so that causes trichomoniasis which is a sexually transmitted disease in this is in human beings you know trichomonas vaginalis so other examples are trichomonas and then uh, trichonympha then spirotrichonympha all these are examples of parabasalids uh, coming next the phylum euglenozoa as i mean say euglena is part of this uh, phylum we have uh, we learned about euglena way back in our school days right euglena and paramecium is it so euglena is a diverse clade that includes predatory heterotrophs photosynthetic autotroph and pathogenic parasites you know it's a it's an admix euglenids and kinetoplastids are the major groups of the phylum euglenozoa and one of the uh, distinguishing feature of this uh, group is that persistence of nuclei uh, persistence of nucleoli uh, during the mitosis so even during the mitosis uh, you know the, the nucleoli uh, uh, is uh, remained in it so that is one of the defining characteristics so cell membrane contains microtubules to stiffen into a pellicle so it is a hard uh, the shape is very characteristic of this euclinosoa it has got pellicles in it uh, with the microtubule uh, it has no cell wall you see it it's it lacks cell wall it reproduces by the longitudinal binary fission anterior to the posterior so that is how the fission is just like bacteria you see it's a eukaryote but it reproduces just like the prokaryotes and there are no sexual reproduction for the euglenozoans uh, euglenids have got one or two flagella that emerge from a pocket at one end of the cell you can see that there is a pocket and from this pocket you can see that there are two flagella but only one flagella is visible the other flagella is uh, very remnant you can see that it's not actually visible outside unless you actually do a uh, you know uh, you dissect uh, this uh, euglena and look under the electron microscope you cannot see that flagella but yeah it has got two flagella by the way this is a part of the bicon i told you remember uh, bicon all bicons have got ancestry two flagella right so it contains a chloroplast surrounded by three membranes so these are not uh, belongs to archiplastida right archiplastida have got uh, really ancestral plastids the chloroplast so these are uh, you know these are result uh, in the euglenoids 
uh, I mean the chrome alveolates or protists are resultant of the secondary endosymbiosis so that is why it's uh, uh, you know it's uh, chloroplast have got three membranes right uh, by engulfing the green algae so it, it's actually from the green algae uh, that it came from not from the cyanobacteria you know so uh, coming to the chlorophyll this group has chlorophyll A and B but it is not masked by any accessory pigments like in the case of chrome alveolates it has got uh, you know a color uh, to mask the pigments right so it, it looks green and there is no accessory pigments in it so this is a generalized picture as you can see that second flagellum and reservoir stigma basal body of the flagella and nucleus there is a one prominent nucleus surrounded by the chloroplast so the chloroplast you can see that uh, you know Paramyelon granules are also part of the cyto cytosol and there is actually a pellicle, a hard pellicle that gives the shape of this uh, this uh, cell, you know, and also it has for contractile vacuoles, right? So that is uh, how the urinates looks like. Some examples of Saccus and uh, Trachelomonas. These are some of the examples of the the eubrinozoans coming next group is kinetoplastids so kinetoplastids have got single large mitochondrion that contains an organized mass of the dna called kinetoplast so that is a defining characteristics of the kinetoplastids it includes free living consumers of the bacteria in the fresh water so it eats the bacteria that is how it gets energy from uh, and it, it you can find this kind of plastics in freshwater and marine and moist terrestrial ecosystems so it is an aquatic species others are parasitic like trypanosoma so trypanosoma bruce gambiens is a very important human pathogen that causes sleeping sickness african sleeping sickness earlier name now the african because of the racist connotation that the name nobody is using is called sleeping sickness uh, the v means vector uh, it's it's basically a, an insect vector this is so it's basically it's it's a fly it's a kind of a fly it's a, a house fly and that is the vector that is the transmitting agent for this particular disease and another one is trypanosoma cruzi uh, cruzi uh, causes chagas disease a very important disease in south america right latin america so it is uh, it's basically by triatomine insect so the vector uh, the, uh, which is uh, behind the transmission of this one is triatomine insects. Uh, another important member of Canetoplast today is Leishmania donovani. So Leishmania causes visceral Leishmaniasis, Kala Azar or black fever or Dum Dum fever. See that uh, that name Dum Dum is uh, uh, you know if you have ever been to Kolkata you can see that there is a place in Kolkata called Dum Dum where the airport is based. So this fever was detected there and that's why uh, the fever is called dum dum. By the way, uh, this is not ethical these days to associate, you know, the place name with uh, uh, the negative connotations, right? So nobody is using uh, this fever that is now gone out of fashion, dum dum fever. So, but anyway, it is actually Kala Azar, the black fever, right? So it's actually from Hindi, isn't it? So it's the second largest protozoan killer in the world. So it's a really important disease. Uh, the vector is female sand fly that is a vector of this particular disease uh, coming to the supergroup rhizaria till now we were discussing more excavates rhizaria might be part of chrome alveolate i've already told you the sar group that is what the latest phylogenetic systematic evidence points to so sar group consists of straminopiles alveolates and rhizaria so rhizarians are amoeboids with phylos phylos means thread like you know, uh, rope-like or a, a needle-like or a thread-like. Uh, uh, that is the shape of this phylos uh, pseudopods. Or reticulose. Reticulose uh, means blend together and form irregular meshes or a network. So it looks like a, a net, you know, uh, intricate meshwork. So that is what the reticulase means. Or it could be uh, in star light. Uh, microtubule supported pseudopod axopods so that is what the the very different kinds of pseudopods in uh, this rhizarians so many produce shells or exoskeletons you know the skeleton like uh, arthropods you see so it's very interesting it forms a shells you know mollusk also forms a shell that these are animals you see but this is this one is not an animal really so which may be quite complex in structure and 
these make up vast majority of the protozoan fossils you know and nearly all have got mitochondria with tubular cristae that is also an identifying characteristic as you see cristae is a part of mitochondria the invagination which is a tu tubular tube uh, like uh, you know the, the shape so that that's a characteristic of the rhizaria so the main groups of rhizaria include foraminifera radiolaria and chlorarachnophyte of cercozoa will come one by one first is foraminifera these are amoeboids with reticulose pseudopods common as marine benthos so reticulose means a uh, mesh like or net like i told you this is common in the benthos that is bottom dwellers or in the seabed like challenger deep while radiolarians are floating on the sea surface right uh, these are planktons amoeboids with axopods so axopod is like star like pseudopods so many have strontium sulfate exoskeleton that's also very interesting rare uh, uh, element you know the, the strontium so this strontium they export from sea surface to abysmal source so abysmal means uh, in, in near the benthos you see uh, pitch dark you know in the ocean if you go deeper it's really dark abyssal so so the strontium from the sea surface it's from the atmosphere the strontium gets deep into the uh, abyssal zone and ultimately into the ben benthic right uh, sediments by these organisms the radiolarian so that is really important for the ecological point of view and uh, coming to the final group that is cercozoa or chlorarachnophyte uh, various amoebian flagellates usually with phyllos pseudopod phyllos means like thread like pseudopods common in soil and tropical oceans you know uh, so even in the soil it's quite common so you can see that the the phylogenetically the, the tree if you look at the, uh, the 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 order in which the you know the branches appear or branches branch out you can see the chlorarachnophyte and forams together forms one clade you know it's a monophyletic group that has a, an ancestor not shared with the radiolarian. So these two are more related, chlorarachnophytes and foraminophren. Uh, and then radiolarian comes in, in picture. Examples of chlorarachnophyte is chlorarachnion, foram is ammonia. Remember, it has got two M, not the, uh, the chemical ammonia, right? Ammonia. And radiolarian circogonia is an example of this radiolarian. So foraminifera or forams is uh, you know the nickname of them uh, that actually the word meaning of foram is that it, uh, it is hall bearers it has got lots of small intricate holes throughout its test test is basically the shell you know uh, the outer covering just like the you know the uh, like mollusk you see very interesting or the turtle <laughs> like the, the turtle it has got shells. So these are named for the porous, generally, you know, multi-chambered shells called test. So the test, that the, this kind of shell is known as test. So predominantly marine benthic. I told you this uh, forams are benthic and even found in Challenger Deep. And the clade has slender pseudopodia that extend through openings in the test made up of calcium carbonate then branch and run together forming a net so that is called reticulopodia the pseudopodia of foram is known as reticulopodia by the way this is made up of calcium carbonate and because of this reason uh, ocean acidification you know this is one of the major consequence of the climate change right oceans are getting acidified because co2 in the atmosphere gets mixed with ocean uh, water to form uh, you know like soda the the, uh, the 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 what we drink right the carbonated water so if you mix the carbon dioxide with water hydro uh, you know uh, hydro uh, uh, carbonic acid is being formed right so carbonic acid brings down the ph of the ocean so that's a major consequence uh, albeit uh, you know uh, overlooked consequence not many people are talking about this consequence so because of this uh, global ocean acidification the shells can get because as when it became acidic acidic uh, you know the sea water becomes acidic these shells become dissolved that's going to have an impact on uh, this important uh, ecologically important organism so foraminifera cannot sustain when the oceans become acidic even a little bit uh, ocean acidification have got tremendous impact on foraminifera you know and forams are also used uh, in uh, you know in in uh, stratigraphy that means that uh, to measure uh, like what, what would be the age of a marine sediment that comes in uh, that is really important 
when you are into a petroleum exploration for example so you know the uh, if, if you are from an oil company uh, looking for this exploration you would need to know the how how old is a marine sediment for that reason you would really need to do you know you would need to date this uh, sediment so there are multiple kinds of dating the sediment dating uh, one is called absolute dating that uh, by using the radio isotopes the other kinds of dating is called relative dating just by looking at the fossils you are more or less you are making intelligent guess about what would be uh, you know the uh, the age of that uh, marine sediment is so uh, using forams for dating is a part of relative dating you see so that is uh, that is a very important uh, application of this foraminifera other important thing is that we, we can use it as an abrasive because it has got shell which is pretty hard you know for rubbing so that kind of use you can use it uh, uh, this particular foraminifera right so uh, um, pseudopodia extend through the pores in the test right so foram tests uh, in the marine sediments form extensive fossil record and especially useful for dating the marine sediments some examples include Bacillus gypsina and ammonia as the name say gypsina the gypsum marine gypsum there are papers that actually relate the gypsum with foraminiferal deposits you know so these two are the important groups of foraminifera coming next group of the rice area is called radiolarians so radiolaria refers to marine testate amoeba testate means amoeba with tests you know the the shells uh, with intricate skeleton and they have very diverse and beautiful forms useful for determining the age of the rock strata just like in the case of foraminifera many have zoosanthellae you know uh, symbiotic uh, uh, many have zoosanthellae so zoosanthellae is symbiodinium that is basically dinoflagellate uh, symbionts of the coral reef you see so symbiotic photosynthetic dinoflagellate so most are photosynthetic so they have got this because of the symbiotic association with dinoflagellate foraminiferans uh, not foraminiferan but the radiolarians are photosynthetic you see so that's very interesting uh, symbiosis with radiolarians and uh, you know the dinoflagellate zooxanthellae so pseudopodia of the radiolarians are known as axopodia so uh, radiolarian pseudopodia is called axopodia because a star like structure as you can see in this picture uh, the axopodia is like a star isn't it so that is what it radiates from the center uh, central body that is uh, what this rice area is uh, about right pseudopodia and uh, this is uh, another example is uh, uh, radiolarian example is circogonia and very excitingly circogonia has got this very very unique uh, you know symmetrical shape uh, there is a name for this shape do you know what this one is so it has got 20 faces the face if you look at the face the the planar face it has got 30 edges so when one face uh, meets another there is an edge so that there are there are 30 edges and there are 12 vertices the corner the vertices you know there are 12 vertices so this one the shape is called icosahedral so this you might have remember in your virology textbooks so in the virology classes so uh, icosahedral is a very common uh, shape uh, symmetrical shape in various viruses you know uh, uh, for example bacteriophage uh, the virus attacking and eating the bacteria and also the polio virus you know icosahedral shape is very interesting so it is the same shape uh, parallelly evolving so there must be some adaptive reason why uh, viruses and radiolarians have got similar uh, you know similar shape nobody knows the reason if you are interested why not take up for your phd it's an exciting topic i always wonder why the, the this uh, circogonians have called icosahedral most probably it's an adaptation you know there are so many unresolved mysteries in science friends uh, it's uh, science is full of curiosity like this you know so other examples of chlor are uh, you know circozoans circo are chlor arachnophytes also known as core circogoans so circozoa so examples include Cercomonas, what you see here is Cercomonas, it's a photosynthetic and Chlorarachnion, very less studied, Chlorarachnion, which is very common in uh, ocean, you know, the marine water, but not many uh, uh, taxonomists have worked on these two groups, Chlorarachnion and Cercomonas. 
and as i told you earlier also there is a huge deficit and a, a huge dearth of trained taxonomists uh, to work on the marine uh, protist and if you are interested why not you know there is there is a it's it, this is called uh, taxonomy bias right so the taxonomists are very less it's not getting really popular these days people are interested to do the phd and a career in uh, trending field like uh, genomics or you know uh, proteomics or molecular biology not many people are working on taxonomy and that is the reason that almost 99 percentage of the ocean uh, you know the ocean uh, microorganisms are yet to be discovered you see the real diversity is now thought to be 1 trillion and we know only approximately 1.2 million you know and only 8 million uh, if you look only the eukaryotes but include the prokaryotes together it's almost 1 trillion almost 99 percentage are uh, yet, yet to be uh, categorized so there's an ocean of opportunities in the marine and aquatic fields